Hello and welcome to Rewildology, the show that explores conservation, travel, and rewilding the planet. I'm your host, Brooke Mitchell Norman, conservation biologist and adventure traveler. All right, so we all know that sloths are freaking adorable and that the whole world has been obsessed with them for well over a decade. Now, what if I told you that a rare miniature sloth exists on a remote island off the shores of Panama? Would you feel intrigued and want to learn more? That's certainly how I felt when I was introduced to today's guest, and I knew that I had to have her on to share her story with all of you. In this episode, we're sitting down with Deeran Smith, DVM, wildlife veterinarian and the world's leading pygmy sloth researcher. As a child, Deeran knew that she wanted to save animals even before she was aware of the term veterinarian. Because her vet work was so long and rigorous, she couldn't study conservation biology while getting her degree. So she decided to contribute to conservation during her professional career. In the early 2010s, DRN was selected to join the Edge of Existence program hosted by the Zoological Society of London. During her fellowship, she laid the foundation for her future Pygmy Soth project. Now, in 2022, DRN is the world's leading pygmy sloth researcher and has won several awards for her work on the species, including the Disney Conservation Hero Award, and is an advisor for the IUCN. DRN and I chat about everything currently known about pygmy sloths, how she partnered with the local indigenous community to create a successful conservation project, the current threats the species is facing, and what's next to ensure that these mini sized sloths stay around for millennia to come. If you're enjoying the show, share your favorite episode with a friend or two that you think would enjoy it too. Also, if you'd like to stay up to date on everything the podcast is getting into, head on over to rewildology.com and sign up for the monthly newsletter. Subscribers hear first about the latest news, updates from past guests, and a recap of the month's episodes, plus a special message from me. <laughs> got so tongue tied there. Oh, goodness. All right, friends. Here's my conversation with Deeran. Hi, Deeran. Thank you so much for coming on today and zooming in all the way from Panama to talk about this very special species and your amazing work. I'm so excited to dive into this. So let's introduce you to everybody. Tell me, where did you grow up? What was your childhood like? And what's the path that you went down? And I guess even on top of that, how did you discover your love of nature? So just take us, like introduce us to everything. <laughs> okay, well, thank you so much, Brooke, for this opportunity. I am honored to be a, as your guest today. Um, and yes, my name is Yoren Smith. I am from Panama. Um, I work as a veterinarian in wildlife in a Somi municipal park. It is a refugee of wildlife. And also I work with the pygmy sloth in a conservation project. And uh, since my childhood, I was, um, I think that I was connected with nature because the, in the place that I live in my neighborhood is surrounded by nature. I live uh, close to the Panama Canal. So there is a lot of forest around. And um, I remember since I was a little girl that I always uh, said to my mom that I wanted to be, um, I didn't say veterinarian because I didn't know the word, but I said doctor of animal. I want to be animal, doc <laughs> animal doctor. And since the beginning, I was very close with any kind of animal that came to my house or to my garden. I remember the first time, probably my first patient was a lizard. <laughs> In Panama, we call the Clean's house lizard. And you know, this kind of animal lost their tail uh, normally. And I was concerned because it was with me. And I said, well, oh, this is my first patient. I'm going to take care of this lizard because it <laughs> lost their tail. And I remember that I feel so like, okay, I have to protect these kind of animals in some point. And then I started um, at the university, University of Panama, and I studied veterinarian. And that time was six years of career. Now they have a new plan, study plan. So now they have five years. Um, and when I finished my last year, I began to do some uh, volunteer here at Summit. 
I started as a volunteer. Um, and I was just follow the keepers, you know, doing the probably the common things, but for me, it was amazing just to be cleaning the house of the, you know, the tape here, the, the pool of the tape or the turtles or that kind of stuff. It was amazing for me because in the university, at the university, it was so difficult to include wildlife in our study plans because it was more for dogs, cats, and, mm. you know, cattle, horse, that kind of animal. And for those who were connected with this kind of animal, it was more about a personal challenge, trying to, to find more about this kind of animal and the way that we can do something for them. So that's why I was volunteer here. When I finished my career, it's these people from SOMI, they called me that I need a veterinarian and I was available, of course. So this was my first, my first job um, as a veterinarian. Probably I was so, I was like, okay, this is a huge responsibility because I am young. Um, I have to learn a lot. But during that journey, because now I have more than 10 years working here, I received a lot of uh, advice from people, from other veterinarians around the world, and they helped me a lot. So I learned a lot. And now I, I believe that this place is, has a, a meaningful for me. It's a, it has too much for me. Wow, that's amazing. So what are the common species that you take care of in the refuge that you work at? And how do they get to you usually? Yes, well, here at SOMI, we receive um, native wildlife. I mean, animals from Panama, just from Panama. Um, we receive animals from confiscation uh, from the Ministry of Environment or from the uh, environmental authorities. Um, we receive rescue animals from particular people. I mean, anybody can see an, uh, or see an animal um, in the road or on the road and something happened with the animal and they want it from us to help them. They bring the animals to us. Um, definitely, probably the most common ones are the orphans. Mm. Uh, and for, about the species, we receive, I mean, monkeys, spider monkeys, Saginus monkeys, it's, um, um, I don't remember the, in English, the Yofrogi, Saginus Yofrogi, it's the small one. I mean, from parrots, a lot of parrots, we receive a lot of parrots and raptors too, reptiles like turtles, that kind of animal. Of course, depends on the situation. Sometimes we receive big animals like a jaguar, oh, tapir. Wow. Mm -hmm and crocodiles in some period of time. I receive a crocodile too. So it depends on the situation because we don't, we try uh, to release all the animals or return to the wild because we are not a zoo. We are more a refugee of wildlife and we are trying to release most of them. But if they have a physical problem, they have to be with us. Um, and they became, um, ambassador of their species. So the people who come to SOMI, they know about their story and why they are here. And sometimes the people complain that they want to see more animals. It's, it's weird because they, I mean, they are in a cage or in, a, in an enclosure, not because they want it, because they cannot be free, of course. And sometimes people complain because they want to see more animals. And, you know, it's sometimes it's weird. I prefer to see them wild and free, knowing an enclosure. Um, and of course, it's not easy for species, some species like monkeys. It's, it's really hard to introduce them in groups and try to release them because sometimes you need a, a specific um, keepers to take care of them. And the, the, the work of rehabilitator is something huge. It's not just to put an enclosure in the forest and let the animal there and they are going to become, you know, to, know, to understand how to survive in the wild. It's not like that. It's more than that. So we know that we need uh, more facilities to do that. So we try in, in the future to have, uh, to keep that in mind and probably have more uh, space 
for those kind of uh, work. Mm, yeah. So everyone's probably like, wait, what's what? She's actually a veterinarian and like you do all of these amazing things as well. So clearly you are wonderful at your job and you are super passionate and you are making a difference being a vet. So why did you decide to also study sloths? So please take us down that journey. When did this idea come and what's the journey that you pursued to start studying these amazing, cute little critters? <laughs> yeah. When I was in the middle of my career, I always wanted to do a conservation project or something related to research with wildlife. So I said, well, I cannot study biology and veterinary because it's, it's too long, but definitely I'm going to include that uh, during my experience as a professional. So I remember that in 2011, researchers from the Zoological Society of London, they came to Panama and they were to Scudo before that uh, visit. And they uh, present a lecture about their experience and also encourage the professional that were, we were there because everybody was invited, I was there, to um, submit a proposal about a conservation project. I remember that I went there because I always work with slots, uh, with, with the two species of slot that we have here in Panama. And we, I didn't realize the pygmy slot. I mean, I was like, okay, there is a species, leisure species, but I never, I mean, I was a, with few knowledge about the species. So I went there to, to hear about the species. And then when they finished, they said that they were encouraged all the professional there to submit a proposal. And I said, okay, this is a good opportunity because they're going to train you in a program that is called Edge of Existence. So I had the opportunity to be awarded with that fellowship and since 2012 I began a conservation researcher from that species and it was a wonderful and challenging experience because I remember when I went with all my um, classmates I can say that when we were to Kenya they um, prepare the training course in Kenya Africa so we went there and I have a beautiful group of uh, professionals, all of them biologists. I was the only veterinarian. Um, all of us, we were presenting and learning more skills about how to do or how to develop our, our projects in our countries. So when I returned, I started to, to do all that I have to do with my conservation project since the beginning, taking in into account many things that probably without their knowledge, uh, with their guides, guides um, or advice, I will never know how to do it because it's not easy to, to develop a conservation project and more in that kind of uh, places, uh, remote places like School of the Veraguas Island and with indigenous community. So it was a beautiful journey that I'm still feel um, committed and I definitely have the opportunity I feel blessed to mix my two patients I mean veterinarian and also research yes oh I can't wait to really start diving into these slaws so okay I think maybe a logical place to start would be people probably don't even know there is such a thing as a pygmy sloth. So maybe let's start there. <laughs> Where is this pygmy sloth? And is it different than its, I guess, quote unquote, bigger counterparts? What makes this species special? And then I really want to get deep into your project itself. Yes. Well, yeah, in Panama, we have three species of sloths. The Bradipus variegatus, uh, who is the three toad sloths is plenty distributed in all Panama and the Coloepus of Mani, the two toad slots, plenty distributed in, in all the, the mainland or, or in Panama. But we have uh, the unique species, an endemic one, the pygmy slot was the only one 
uh, in critical danger who live in a small island called Escudo de Veraguas Island, who is located in the Caribbean side of Panama. And why is so important? Because it's the only one is, uh, species who has a, um, okay, this is difficult to pronounce for me. Dwarf, dwarf, dwarf. So, it was uh, dwarfism. Is oh, the, dwarfism. Yeah, that's yeah. what. <laughs> that's not an dwarfism. easy word. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it, this is this is experiment uh, something that we know as a dwarfism phenomenon. That's why it's so different uh, to the other species. Uh, their size, uh, the weight less than the species, species from the mainland. And of course, it's in critical and danger because live in a very small island. So every kind, any kind of um, disturbance in this island is going to affect directly these species. In general, it looks similar to the Bradipus variegatus, but it when was discovered as a new species in 2001, uh, by Anderson and Hanley, they made uh, morphologic and, and um, measurements of the spool of everything of the body, and they compared to the different slots from the islands in the archipelago of Boca del Toro. That's why the pygmy slot, who live in the oldest island from the archipelago in Boca del Toro, uh, is less um, is a dwarfism. dwarfism phenomenon, have that word, dwarfism phenomenon. And this dwarfism phenomenon is when a species, a mammal, a big mammal is, is, is lives in a, a specific area, probably don't given too much resources, eventually through the years is going to be smaller or reduce their size. While the species or animals, smaller animals in that a specific area that is small, like an island, has a lot of resources, probably is going to be a little bit more bigger, a bit bigger than animals from the mainland. That's why in, in, in the Escudo de Veraguas, we have the pygmy slot, who is dwarfism, dwarfing, but we have uh, the human bird, who is a Gaian human bird, in, compari in comparison to the mainland. So that's why um, the pygmy slow is so important because it's, it's unique. And of course, it's part of an island who is too small. So that's why, that's why it's a, a endangered species, critical endangered species. Mm. So then what is the biggest issues that they're currently facing or the biggest threats? Well, this is very uh, interesting because in the beginning of my project, when I was there um, and I was talking with the indigenous community, because I, and when I started, I started to walk, to walk with them, to be with there, to live with the indigenous community, just to know more about what they know about the pygmy slot, what they know about the island, and how can I um, give them more knowledge about how the species living there and how to protect them in the future. And in that, period of time, like seven years ago, one of the big traits was um, the number of people there using, a lot of people there using their, their trees, the mangroves, uh, because they're using the mangrove for cooking, some other important trees, because they're using to build houses in the island, and a lot of uh, fishermen and divers living in the island uh, during the season just to, to, do, to use the resources from the island, but at the same time, using the forest that probably is, of course, important from the pygmy slot. But now, one of the threats that probably is not going to change a, too much from that time is the, the increase of tourism mm -hmm. in the island. Now everything changed. Now there are more people um, with tourists using the island as a beautiful place to stay there. And the pygmy slot is one of the attractions. So that is something sensitive because it's a 
important species and we have to be, we have to increase our information about their trees. I mean, if they are healthy, if they are, you know, we are doing genetic studies too. And this kind of um, perturbance or disturbance from the people's more anthropogenic activities in the island is going to put this small animal in, in trade. And that is the problem that we are facing now with the pygmy sloth. Is obviously it's one of the most flat species and this charismatic species, but at the same time is attractive for our track called um, the illegal traffic of a species. Mm -hmm. So this is another threat that the pygmy sloth is, is facing. So are people, so I, I, I want to make sure I completely understand what, like the new threats that are coming in. So are these people from mainland Panama coming and like taking them out of the wild and putting them in the illegal market? Or are they just like setting up like tourist selfie stations? Or is it a blend? Or is it the indigenous community seeing like a way to make more money through tourism? Like, or is it a blend of all of this? Like what, what have you seen on the ground here? Yes. Well, recently we know that is everything is blended now. Mm -hmm. um, there are tourists that go there and they want to take a picture with the pygmy sloth. They want to hold the pygmy sloth and take picture. And we know that because indigenous communities, they are small from different areas and everybody knows themselves. And when I go there, they say, oh, well, uh, I bring, um, I brought some tourists and they wanted to, you know, be close to the pygmy sloth. And sometimes there are not people from the area. I mean, they're from the mainland, not exactly from the coast near Scudo, not from those communities. Because in 2013, something not good happened on, on Scudo. They were taking or 10 pygmy slots for somebody who wants to um, have it in a private collection in the United States. In 2013, that happened, and everything changed since then. The indigenous people get mad with everybody because I lose one year of um, I lost one year of uh, research because they closed the island for everybody because they started to don't trust in every in anybody mm -hmm. uh, since then, and the attention from the pygmy slot increased because now. They know that this small species, this animal that they probably they don't care that is there because they are doing something in the you know in the in the they are diving for fit for lobsters, they are fishing, they are not exactly seeing the pygmy slot as a resource. It's just like the slot there. And now they know that people around the world want the pygmy slot. So they were more aware about. What are you doing here? And that was probably one of the questions that sometimes they asked me when I was there in the beginning. What are you doing here? Why do you want to protect these species? And of course, on the other hand, we have that kind of people with um, irresponsible tour operators that go to Scudo and they just want to be there to take selfies, not exactly to hold the animal, but and the, at the end, what they receive from Escudo, nothing. Escudo is more than just a beautiful island. Escudo is, has a lot of story to tell with the people who visit them. It's, it's a um, legacy from the indigenous community people. It's so important for them. Um, they call Dego, they don't call Escudo. Dego is the name of the other indigenous, according to their stories, the, the, the Go indigenous fight with the Nobe indigenous, and then the Nobes win that fight. And finally, the Dego became on rocks on a, in Escudo, uh, became of part of the resources from Escudo. And I remember in the beginning of my, of my research, when I was there and I spent the night with, you know, with people around, and I was asking the stories of Escudo, some of them, they were scared to be to the forest, to go to the forest. They just go to the beach and they have their small houses there, temporary houses. 
and they never go to the forest because they don't feel that it's important. Sometimes if they have to, you know, log in, log, log in mm -hmm. they do, or they, they did in that moment, but they don't feel that they have to go inside the forest because some of them, the oldest one, or the elder people were scared, but the young people, they don't care. They don't believe in those stories because part of the culture is, uh, the indigenous sometimes is going to, they're losing their stories. Mm -hmm. You know, the stories mm -hmm. telling from the eldest one um, is now losing from the youngest one. And now they don't understand what is so, um, it's, 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 it's difficult for them to connect why the island is so important and why they don't go, don't, never visit the forest, inside the forest of the island, because for them now it's, it's so easy to go there. And probably they want to explore another opportunities of incomes. And that's why we always persistence to do education in the communities, because people change, people need, need to work, need to maintain their families in some way. And Escudo probably is the only researcher. So we have, we really believe, and I believe that the only way that Escudo is going to be there forever, or at least all the resources there are going to be enjoyable for more than we want, or for more time, um, is just do an, community sustainable, a sustainable tourism, leading by the people from the communities. And it's a good way to, for them to see the school as a, okay, I can receive a resource from this island and I protect the island too. If they start, and this is something that I always wanted to let them know, if you destroy the mangrove area, which is a really small part of the, uh, of the island, or you destroy some trees that probably are important from the pygmy slope, but you don't know because we are in that process to understand that. Uh, at the end, what you're gonna show to the tourists? Nothing. <laughs> they don't wanna see, they don't want to see the pygmy slope, they're not going to see anything, just what? Even the marine resources from the island is still unknown. How is it? How is, you know, there are a lot of study that we have to do there. And it's not an easy way, an easy place to work because it's remote and um, you need a lot of uh, work with the community and being persistent. Speaking of, that is the perfect transition to my next question. So this is an indigenous community in a very rural place. How, how did you connect with them? You know, as a researcher, as an outsider, like obviously they were very skeptical and it sounded like they had good reason. There was a time when people came in and like took their wildlife. Like I would feel insanely upset as well if somebody did that to my homeland. So can do you remember what that was like? Did you just like show up to this island and be like, hi, <laughs> I'm here. <laughs> so take us through that. How did you actually start this project and go from there? Yeah. Yeah, well, in the beginning, I received the support from my from my advisor from the Edge team, and we were together um, just to know the people there to present my study because to to do something or send a scientific scientific project on a scudo, you need the permit from the communities oh. and the the permit from the um, the, the the authorities, uh, indigenous authorities. So it's, it's, it's important. If you have your scientific permit from the Ministry of Environment, they are going to request that approval from them. So it's, it's very important before to go there and appear like, hello, to have that connection with the authorities and let them know what you're going to do. They always, um, I would say that probably they are uh, careful with the people around because they don't trust to anybody. I was lucky to have in my team people from the area uh, since the beginning. My assistant is, is a professional from one of the communities, uh, indigenous communities. So he knows Novere 
I didn't know nobody. I don't know nobody. I cannot speak with their language. So it was important for me since the beginning to be with him and trying to to be connected with them, even in their own language. Mm -hmm. Because when I was uh, doing my first trip uh, to the communities, I spent, I decided to spend a week in some communities just to be with them. And I stay like a week and just live with them, walk with them, eat with them, I mean, everything. And I learned a lot about their, their customs and their culture. I was doing some surveys and before to do the surveys, I, um, I put it in, I mean, I put in contact with some NGOs here in Panama who work with indigenous Nove to know more about what to do and what don't do with, with them because I, I didn't want to be uh, disrespectful for them. I mean, I want to, to do the right things. So I spent the time with them and that helped me a lot because when I started my project, they know me. <laughs> so it was easy to be in the island and say, hey, hello. Oh yeah, yes, yes uh, the, the lady who is working with the thing is lost. Um, it was better because I received, as to tell you the truth, I received all the complaints from other researchers who were there to Scuro and never take, and I mean, never connect with them. It's just, mm. I know that it's a um, language barrier because probably that's why the reason some researcher never talked with them. But at the same time, they feel that people go there, take what they need for their researcher and then just go away and never return the knowledge or anything. That's why they, I received all the complaints. And I said, okay, that is not going to happen with me because you are part of my team. And I, it's a good way because this, this is the only way that they can learn and they know what I'm doing. So I spent weeks uh, with, uh, with them in the, on the island during my first trip and they were there and always um, helped me to do my research uh, or do my transit or walk through the transit, you know, anything. And that was, that was good. That was perfect because they understand what I was doing in a simple way, just look at me. And when I do my, the other part, the education part in the schools and workshop with the fishermen and divers, uh, I was trying to put all what I was doing in my trips in a simple way that they can understand. And, you know, this is my, my first uh, results of my first trip. And I, I know that I count this number of uh, uh, speak me slow, and now I'm going to, to see in this part of the island. So probably you're going to see me there. You know, I spent a lot of uh, time there. And that was difficult because I was working here mm. and I had to use my vacation for that. So I always was working. Yes, in the beginning, I just was uh, taking my vacation of, split my vacation to do my research, uh, my field research. Mm -hmm. mm, so I'm sure balancing that was not easy at all. No, 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 it's not, it's not, no, it's not. <laughs> no. No. But it does sound like you invested the time in the community and that has paid you back tenfold because it sounds like they really trust you and that they've really welcomed you as a researcher on their island. Yeah, I luckily I have a very good relationship with, with the people there. And uh, it's good because I know the authorities and they, and they have authorities for the five years and then they change the authorities like like a you know, like in any country with the president and that kind of stuff. And sometimes their son or their child were part of the school when I were was there. Uh, talking about the previous law. So it was it was good because they were, all the family were involved in that process. Now I can say that I have good friends there. Um, if something happened with the pygmy slot or with any slot, they send me picture and say, this is happening there. You know what is happening or something related to, to any slot. And it's nice, uh, but at the same time, it's that it's, it, I, I take in 
that like a, a huge responsibility because now I have that committed with the people and I, I am aware that I have to, you know, sometimes I remember in the beginning, um, a, per, a person told me that you never, never try to say something to the indigenous that you are not going to achieve because they remember your words. So trying to be realistic in your study. And I, in the beginning, I was trying to do many things. And I realized I didn't have the time. Uh, it was too much. So I was doing step by step. Um, it's a long process. It had been a long process um, because it's not easy to study a slot in the forest and in the mangrove. You know, it's a, it's a difficult species to study sometimes. So it, it take me, it have been taking me, take me time, but it had been um, a wonderful journey. <laughs> I can totally see that. Uh, this past November, for anybody who's been listening to the podcast, I was in Costa Rica. And of course, one of the things you're always trying to do is find a sloth in the wild. And it is not easy. I can't even imagine a mini one. Like, <laughs> I mean, it was hard enough to find the three fingered, three toed ones. And so I can only fathom what it's like to find one that's like half the size of that and, and a luscious mangrove. But speaking of that, so, okay, so we have all of this information and you're actually there. You're invested in the community. They've welcomed you. Now, what are you actually studying? What is your research? What kind of questions are you looking to answer? And maybe if you wouldn't mind sharing, what have you discovered yourself in your work so far? Yeah, well, in the beginning, we were with the simple things. How many pinky slots are in the island? <laughs> and this is a question that probably the people still ask me. And, and I say, okay, we are in the process to analyze all the data because in the beginning, we were changing a lot of the methodology. Mm. with my advisor because it's not easy. Uh, we were uh, concentrated in the mangrove area. So we have permanent transect there. And we walk to the transect every year, twice. So we have that number of individuals that we probably know how many are in that part. And if something happened or any variation, you know, put everybody in alert that something has happened. Mm. But still we have to, analyze all the data collected since 2014. So it's a lot of work. And also we include the behavior of the pygmy sloths. So we put some uh, GPS collar to 10 adults, uh, females and males. And actually we, we all the pygmy sloths uh, collared, we put novated names. So the people, my team, they, according to the personality of the slot, we just give some uh, specific names. And it was, it was good because when we have to return, because the colors, uh, they uh, stay with the color for a year. So the, ten, the time that we were there, just to see what it, that everybody, everything was okay. Um, they come with me and they start to call them with the name. So they remember the name that they given. Uh, to the pygmy slot. So it was, it was, a, it was funny and it was perfect. Um, so it was uh, a part of the project to you know the home range of the species uh, on the island. And also uh, we are in that process and probably with the preliminary results, it's not that different from the Radicus variegatus in mainland. So it's, it's interesting, everything, all the, all the, the founds, uh, all the, the, the things that we are discovered through these years. And also we include the genetic analysis just because we need to know the, you know, the variability of the species uh, in this small island that also is important. And um, we collaborate with, um, sorry, a botanist collaborate with us to identify uh, plants that are using with the, uh, to the pygmy sloth as a, um, refugee and uh, as a diet, as part of their diet or uh, as part of uh, a refugee, refugee. I think that is the name. Yeah. So yeah, it's, it's, it's everything and all this information is going to be really important for the conservation plan for the species and from the management plan from the island. Because, you know, now we know that there are 
the mangrove is not the only diet from the pygmy slow, the leaf uh, from the mangrove trees. We know that there are more trees, important trees in the forest that are important from the pygmy slow. Um, and some of them are just connectors to go to other part of the island. So it's, it's, it's every year we, we know that there is a lot of information that we need to, to study with the pygmy slow. A lot of things is going to happen in the future with this species. And so when do you think that, I mean, obviously, um, you are an integral part of creating this conservation plan or these recommendations to authorities that will then foresee this plan out. When do you think that that'll be ready? I'm sure that it, that'll be a huge accomplishment to be like, here's the plan. <laughs> Well, we started le last year because we were preparing the people from Nove Bugle people to information that what we were doing all this year. And sometimes we were given some, you know, tips, like this is uh, another way to, to increase your income, not exactly as a fisherman and diver, because they are art artisanal fishermen and divers. So it's a Sometimes it's a danger work oh, wow. because they don't use anything. They just, you know, keep the bread and then go like four meters to, yeah, to grab the, the lobster. And then it is, it's very dangerous. And they realize and they know that, but what, what else they're going to do? So that's why we always try to give them ideas to do something. And also with the tourism, we are trying to encourage them to, to use their own communities because all that part of Panama are so beautiful. They know that they are beautiful communities and probably they're going, it's better to receive the tourists and spend the night there than in, instead of go to Escudo and spend the night there. And probably that is safe, it's a safe way to protect the island and a safe way to protect the tourists because it's being a scudo, you need to be careful and aware for many things because it's not like uh it's, it's two hours or probably an hour from um, the mainland so mm. or 45 men, um, minutes from the nearby community um so you need to be a, a, a take a, a, into account all that stuff but the last year, we finally had the first workshop about the conservation plan of the species. So we did it in the Nove Bugle communities just because we want from them all the information about the, the threats, about how you can mitigate the threats. Um, if you identify the threats, how you is, is score the, ter the threats, like what, what, which one is the, the, the worst and which one is the less one. That kind of information we received from them in our first workshop and prepare all the information, help us to do our second workshop about the, the conservation plan, more focus on the action lines and, you know, with more uh, stakeholders in Panama. And we're going to do this in a couple of, of months here. So all this part is, is we are happy with that because now we have information enough to show them um, and they know that something is happening in the island and they want to help in that process. Uh, we did um, community mapping from Escudo de Veraguas Island. It was uh, in 2018, we just, invite people from different communities near Scudo. And we put the Scudo Island map and they identify the resources. They um, identify the intensity of use on some part of the Scudo Island uh, from that resources. And finally, they identify the tricks. So they, in according to their own knowledge, I mean, I never say something. We never try to, you know, lead in the information to make them say probably the tourism or probably, you know, the invasive species. No, no, no. It was only the Nove people said they were open to say everything that they want to say. 
And we have three maps, very important because they feel proud of that. And they saw that that resourcer, that maps or those maps now are part of the conservation uh, information from the conservation plan of the species. So of course we need a management plan from the island. But at least if you protect the scudo or you protect the pygmy slot, you know that you're going to protect a scudo because it's, 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 this is their home. <laughs> this is the way it is place where he lives. So it's okay. Oh, that is wonderful that they're so engaged. And just like you said, yeah, it's like a flagship species for the entire island. And so, oh, that is wonderful that they are so engaged and they're like, yeah, we are helping make this conservation plan like that is yeah. oh my gosh that is so cool so then what 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 do you, would you say is like your future goal or where do you see this going like what is the bigger picture here on what the how this is going to develop i mean the island i would imagine more people are going to want opportunity so what are you foreseeing will happen with this in like the next decade or two well, um, the vision that I have from the island is uh, um, a place, a selective place where people can go there and know about the story of the island through the indigenous, an organized indigenous community uh, people who receive the tourists. And we, we, I really expect in the near future to I don't know in Spanish, in English, but in Spanish, it's sonificar is sonification of the island. You know, to know where part of the island are allowed for the tourists to be, where parts are not allowed because it's vulnerable or mm. is you know you need to be careful. This is the way that I see the island in the future. We want, on a, I say we because when I say we, is, I, I I feel it, I believe that I'm talking with a lot of people behind me with yeah. the same feeling. Um, we want the Scudo as a, as, Scudo is a natural laboratory. Mm. Uh, it's a center of endem endemism. And there is a lot of stuff that we need to know about the island now um, because everything is going on too fast and the island is not going to wait to do something. So that's why we, I am, pushing more in of this conservation plan because it's the only way that we put in the same table all the stakeholders and the authorities from the Nove Bugle Indigenous and the Ministry of Environment because the island is a protected area from the Ministry of Environment. So we need to be to, to have all the pieces together to take decision, important decision to all the species living there. Um, and of course, we know that in the near future, it's not that near, I mean, I don't see it like a long, long future. Uh, it's, it's like in a couple of years, probably in two years, we have to do something now because we really want a permanent or, or preserved island to be still enjoyable for the people who go there in, respectfully and of course we want that the island still be part of the income from the people in the communities because it's the only way that they feel that we are not closing them to still going to Scudo but they need to be responsible in a way that they use their resourcer. So it's not easy because it's, we are talking about people who are doing something for years, and then you're going to say, you know what? You need to stop bringing tourists because it's not good. And then they see in the island uh, an op tourist operator from Panama, or maybe mm. a jade, or maybe a catamar catamaran, catamaran, or another ship, big ship with tourists. Um, and they say what well, they can and I cannot. And this is, uh, this is my island. So we know that the island is in the eye of international big uh, companies who wants to develop uh, tourism there. But 
in the moment that we allow that, these people are going to lose everything. We are going to lose many things. Mm. Yeah. And now that this island is getting on the world stage, which is why I'm so grateful to bring you on at this time. Like we're right at the moment where if we do this right with you and your amazing team and everyone, you know, like we can save this island. So let's say that, so this, this uh, podcast is just as much about travel as it is conservation. And it's a blend of all of that. So let's say that somebody listening might want to go to Panama and they would really like to go see the pygmy sloth because we are, we just all love animals. They're hearing you and they're like, oh my gosh, I would love that experience. How can we as the international community help the pygmy sloth? Is there a way that we can do that? Is there a way to go see these critters sustainably at this time? Do you know operators that might be able to do that? Or are we not there yet? Or what's your current opinion or thought on that for somebody who's like, should I, can I book a ticket in like six months or should I be waiting two years before coming to the island is a sustainable option? Yeah, this is an important um, thing because nowadays, in the beginning we were talking and I was thinking that, well, in the less way that I'm show picture from Scudo, less people are going to be there. Or less, I less, it was my, my, my way to, to think about how to protect the island. And I was like, okay, I'm not going to put too much fish picture of the pygmy law because I don't want the people go there immediately <laughs> because that is the, the feeling. Of course, I love slots. People love slots. Who in the world doesn't love it? Exactly, especially <laughs> a drawer fund. Oh my gosh. <laughs> exactly. So, but now I realize that you cannot stop the people to leave the experience, but at least they can go to responsible tourist operator because it's a far away area. It's a remote area. Um, if you go to, if you came to Panama, you come to Panama, it's a good way to to know about tour operator, if you have the experience to go there before to say, I'm going with this, um, this specific one, you have experience to go there because believe me, I went through a terrifying experience on boat going to Escudo because in the beginning I was too, like, okay, it's not just go to the island, put my jacket, I mean, it's fine. and. Some of the boatmen, they never have a tool of box, or maybe I have a problem with, they have a problem with the gene with me there, and we were in the middle of nothing in the sea. And, you know, I know that kind of experience because I, I, I passed from that in the beginning. So nowadays it's, it's better to, to ask with that guy or that person who's going to let you there if you uh, have experience traveling to Scudo on boat. And of course, it's better if this is people from the community or from the area. Now on internet or Instagram, there are people who have experience um, and they are from the communities. They are a little bit more organized. Some of them trying, and it's something that I really um, respect because they are thinking about the future. They wanted the people to to sleep with in, in the communities, not in the scudo. And they have a special um, houses from the tourists. And the tourists can ex ex experience, um, you know, live with an indigenous community, eat their food and see their custom. And then the next day, visit the scudo and spend the day, but not spend the night there. Because all the beaches around the scudo are. Uh, important from sea turtles. Uh -huh. So you need to be aware of how is going to be your behavior seeing that experience because sometimes there are tourists too excited and take pictures, you know, in the moment that some sea turtles go to the beach. And that is, is, is a huge problem. So my advice is just to be aware of that kind. You have to search a little bit more. And of course, there are some of them uh, trustful uh, as a Oper tourist operator and they know a lot about your behavior because what happened 
during my um, field trips, and I was, I remember once I was in the mangrove area and suddenly appeared a boat with a, a loud and noisy music oh, uh, wow. with tourists. And I was like, what is this? Uh, and, and they just start to to walk and take picture of me because I was like, you know, this is a oh, researcher. <laughs> we have to take picture. So that, that's the kind of stuff that probably is not like, no, it's, we don't want that. We want res uh, people responsible. And and even the, turi the tourist guy, he never say like, no, no, don't do that. Or, you know, it's, it's a peaceful place to, to um, contemplate their beauty and, you know, not to disturb the, 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 the peace of that um, land. So this is my recommendation. I mean, it's, it's better if you do that. And of course you are given an income or in um, helping with the communities people who are trying to uh, experiment another way to, uh, another way of income to their family to sustain their family. Yeah, and do you happen to know of any sort of good tour operator off the top of your head that you have that you might want to give a shout out to or if anybody is interested, maybe they should start with them? Yeah, sometimes they call me and they ask me. I've received uh, some of the, some people who wants to go to Scudo and they start to ask to the researcher who were working there. And I received a lot of people asking me uh, if I have somebody who can let them uh, to go to Scudo or, or have the experience to visit Scudo responsibly. And I just put in contact with this uh, that tourist guy that I know. It's more than once, but it's, it's a good way. And of course, it's not it's not cheaper to go to Scudo. It's, it's expensive because Scudo is, is far away. And is this something that you need to understand when people want to go there? Um, you know, it's just to, to, the pollution is something that we are dealing now because um, people really need to understand that nobody is going to clean your garbage when you're going to school. So it's now a problem because some tourists, they just, you know, go to the mainland and return with their garbage, but some, others let them uh, on the beaches. So it's, it's, it's a problem now, and even with the local people. So they need to understand that nobody's going to be there to clean it. So you have to clean everything. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Wow, yeah, there's so many layers to this. It's like right at the point where, luckily it sounds like with your amazing work and your team and everybody you're collaborating with, like, we can stop it before it gets to a bad place. Like you see all the things now as it develops and partnering with sustainable guides and hopefully making a whole sustainable tourism model. Like that is the only way that tourism is done here. And it also gives the community a different yeah. income that monetizes mm -hmm. their island essentially that doesn't destroy it. Uh, yeah, that is so powerful. <laughs> Yeah, it's not easy. It's not easy because you need, I mean, we need a permanent station from the rangers because we don't have it. And oh, it's a protected wow. area and you need a permanent ranger from the Ministry of Environment there. The rangers in that part of the country, they are from the Comarca Nove. They are indigenous people and they know the people from their community. So sometimes it's not easy to them deal with their own neighbor, oh, you know, yeah, and that that is be like, mm -hmm, because they want, you know, they have, they have a responsibility, but at the same time, you know, he's my friend and his friend is going to complain with him about, you know, this is the way that I need my, the money for my children. And now you want me to stop. And, you know, it's not easy for them. And sometimes it's not easy when they are not there permanently. They patrol the island during the season, sometimes, well, actually, uh, two weeks ago, they were patrolling the island and they saw two guys who were stolen an endemic plant from a scudo. Oh my gosh. Stolen? Stealing, stealing. Yeah, 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 you're, 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 you were good. That was the right I word. Was like, 
<laughs> yeah, and and they just confiscated the plant, took the you know the the name of these guys, and that's it. They cannot do more than that. It's 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 it's, it's sad because probably in other places they they need to enforce the law and. No, it's something that they cannot do now, but at least they were there in the moment that that happened. And it was curious, it was a plant. So people know what, what is in the scudo. It was a illegal traffic of plants, not a pygmy slug, not the, the frog, not the, you know, the, the bats, no, a plant. So people search a lot. Of, even it's easy now to see people selling the scudo frogs. On Instagram. On Instagram. Yeah. Ah. <laughs> yes. Yes. And it's it's something that is not good. It's not good at all. No. And I love that you bring that up. This this point of protecting the island is going to require protection and. I think that maybe that's such an overlooked part, but that is so true. Like how can you enforce a conservation plan or a protected island or like a protected status, like a national park or whatever the status would be, you have to protect that with people and with authoritative figures. And that's like a whole other layer to this of government resources, of people that want to be there and actually confront people that are doing illegal things. Like there's a whole other side of this. Yeah, we do need sustainable tourism, but at the same time, someone needs to enforce these laws. And mm -hmm. that is a whole other ball game and getting a government body on board and training people properly. And yeah, the, there's a lot you have going on. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, it's, it's not, yeah, it's a lot of pieces that we have to put together. And it's not, it's not easy because the relationship with the, the indigenous community, uh, the indigenous government with the government of Panama is not easy to deal. Mm -hmm. It's not easy. And sometimes they think in a way, the indigenous people think in a way, and the government think in other way. And my job is just to put everybody together and try to, you know, come and we can find solution from the problem that everybody knows about the problem. But now we are not going to, to fight in this moment. We have to find a solution. That's why the, the conservation plan is like, you know, find a path to continue our, our, our working in the, uh, on the island. But it's not easy because everybody needs to be um, you know, something that we don't want is to have this conservation plan and, okay, it's, it's a good piece of paper and that's it. We want this piece of paper being developed correctly with all the people uh, allowed to do it, with the authorities there. You know, in some point, we want the Minister of Environment have more a budget to continue the patrol and to give these people the budget or to put their eyes in that small piece of island because you know Panama is so a, it's such a beautiful uh, country and I'm not saying because I'm Panamanian because it's, it's a, <laughs> such a beautiful country <laughs> and the island is it's a small piece of that you see the the geographically the the, the country I just see that point there is a scudo it's just a little thing and we can lose the little thing quickly because we are not doing uh, the right thing at the moment. We need to do it now. And that's why believe, we believe that just a piece of paper is not going to help. We definitely need more people together, more stakeholders given, because you know what? The people there, they want to help, but they don't know how to start. So that's why if we give them some ideas to you know, this uh, community can organize with this one. They don't know how to start. And, and, and we have to, to help them in that process. That's why we need a lot of stakeholders with them, helping them, the indigenous people. We need, because they want to, to make a difference in their land, but they need to know how. And sometimes they need to be persistent because in the beginning, they also need the money. Right. And if they don't see it, 
in their correct moment on the beginning of all the four that they are trying to do for something, they just decide, well, I'm going to, to quit. I'm going to still do what I was doing before and I don't care about the, the island now. If the island disappears, then I'm going to another place. That's why. Escudo is a landscape area, protected area. And that category is because we include the indigenous legacy. Mm. Uh, the importance of the island from the Nove Bugle indigenous community. I remember in the beginning of my project when I talked with them, they were uh, worried if all this, all this information that I'm going to, that I was collected from the island, at the end, they are not going to be allowed to be in the island. And they oh, were really? scared of that. Wow. Yeah. Because they say, we don't want to be like um, a Galapagos Island, you know, in Galapagos yeah. there is a very specific island with a high, you know, if you want to go there, there are a lot of restrictions, you need to follow rules and that kind of stuff. And they don't want to lose that. So they were, um, they reject the idea to do something there or to enforce, enforce the law. Because they say, if you change this category to a protected area or to sanctuary or something, we are going to lose the opportunity to be there. That's why we have to be careful about how to deal with all this uh, thing about Escudo. The authorities in Panama are trying to create um, a paper with rules. And that is important because at least they know now what is going to be allowed or what is not need to be allowed in Escudo. Because now we have more people going there. We have tourists, tourists and local people uh, bringing their pets, dogs, cats. Oh, really? Uh, yeah. <laughs> oh my yes. gosh. And it's an it's invasive species yeah. to the island. Yeah. So it's a problem too from, this, from the pygmy sloth and from many animal, other animals. And now we have to be uh, careful to, to do that, to, to see the people doing that and how you're going to say that to the indigenous people who they are not, they don't have other person or other people who take care of their pets. And that's why they bring into the island with them when they are spending the time there. It's, it's not easy to deal with that, but that's why when the, in, each of my journeys uh, on my field trip, I always be in company with the rangers from the Ministry of Environment. They always be with me. And in that time, because now they have a boat, in that period of time, like five years ago, they don't have a boat. So they using the boat that I have to, to be there in the island, at least in a week or two weeks, see what happened and collect information. Um, it was good because they talked with the people, with their own neighbors about the scudo, about what I was doing, and, and you know, just be there. It, it was important because we have a ranger there, and sometimes we saw a lot of uh, tourists there, uh, and they trying to explain them about the, how to behave in this island, and it was good. One thing that I love about this field in general is how we all go into this for a species that we really love. And then most of what we end up doing is managing and working with people. Because <laughs> yeah. if you've noticed, almost our entire conversation has actually been about just human dynamics in yeah. this like a very little bit about it has actually been about the pygmy sloth, which I find yeah. so fascinating. This is almost every single conversation I have. And as part of the reason why this podcast exists is for that exact reason. It's all about people. Like the pygmy sloth is amazing. They are great at living in their beautiful trees and being super cute and like doing their thing. And it's, us working with each other and tourists and indigenous communities and authorities and the government and fishermen and all of these people like to just make sure that the pygmy sloth can just be itself on this yeah. cute little <laughs> island. 
Yeah, people are more complicated. Definitely, yeah. yes. <laughs> that, that's why I'm working with animals. But yeah, I mean, we cannot do um, conservation without education. So that's why we have to be include that. And this is something very, very good with the EDGE program because they include both. As you cannot submit a proposal without, conserv with, without education part. The education part is so important. And um, I realized that any time that I go there. I remember that I cried when I, when I spent one week in Kusapin, an indigenous community, and I was so happy talking with the people about the Piggy's Law, showing some picture. And I was talking with a professor in a school, and he said, you know what? Uh, we, if we want, we cannot let you to go to school though, because you are not, Nove, you are Panamanian. It says, uh -huh. it says, and you are not Nove indigenous. You need to be Nove, and this is our land, and this is, and we, it like, yes, but the island is in Panama. I mean, it's the same thing. Um, and I'm Panamanian, you are Panamanian too. I mean, it was like, but I was like, okay, he's really going to, don't let me go to the island. And I was crying and saying, well, what? Uh, because I was feeling, that I was losing the opportunity to start with my project. And in that moment, I realized that it's, it's that connection with the people there is good to understand them too, because he was afraid that me, and not a novice student, was doing something that probably a novice student deserved more because this is their land. That was their land, that is their land. And is they live a simple life there, you know. We are living in the city, we have a lot of stuff with us, and they're just thinking the island is there and probably never is going to disappear. And it's not easy to create that bond between the pygmy slot, the forest, and the mangrove, uh, and the same thing. It's complicated to work with the people, but I have to empathize with them to understand how to to know, to deal with these things and to give my knowledge to them, to empower them to, to protect their land. Because I know that they protected the island still uh, remain preserved. You know, the forest still looks the same thing, but we need to stop what we are doing now. But they're definitely, definitely um, in some point, we're protective with the scudo. Yes. Oh, it's just amazing. And all, and also you bringing all the stakeholders in and being able to be a voice for both directions. It's really amazing. And the next question I loved it, I would love to ask you to flip the lens a little bit and go back to you. You've told us so many amazing things that you do. You're a fantastic wildlife veterinarian. You're like doing this amazing project and you've put pygmy slaws on the map and you're an advisor here and you're doing all these crazy things that are so impressive. But there has to be some struggles in all of this. And because none of our journeys are perfect. And I really love to talk about this kind of stuff just to help because, you know, someone might hear these amazing things that you've done and be like, oh my gosh, how could I ever do anything similar? So would you be okay maybe sharing with us a couple hard things or struggles that you've gone through that you've had to overcome in this amazing journey that you've had so far? Yeah, yeah, sure. Well, in the beginning, I was with a lot of struggle because I am not a biologist and my base is, is medicine. And I feel that sometimes here in Panama, it's not easy to understand when somebody is doing something different. Mm -hmm. And I mean, I am not biologist and some, sometimes people uh, remember me or remind me anytime when I have to say something because you know, you're not biologist and you're a veterinarian. And, but that is a thing that I, is a challenge. And I received um, a good, uh, support with my advisors from EDGE and of course with incredible people here in Panama that are good uh, wildlife researcher too and I feel that that helped me to deal with something that is 
still is is a, a problem. And I mean, probably for a biologist, it's easy to go to the forest and start to do their stuff because they have a base on school or the university. For me, it was more about to learn uh, different things that I need, and of course, the, to analyze that things. Mm is more uh, difficult because in my career, even if I want to do, and this is a problem probably in Latin America, if we want to do research, even in veterinary, we don't receive all the, 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 um, the skills to develop as a researcher. It's more about medicine. And sometimes in Latin America, a veterinarian need to be in a clinic and a seat and doing surgery. And it's more than that. You know, it's a it's a huge uh, it's a career with a huge opportunity, and the same thing makes my career with my passion to be in the forest. is it was a um, it was a challenge, but at the same time, it was um, a time where I can relax from the daily clinic stuff. So when I any time that I'm going to school, though, even it was my vacation, and I was a lot of I have to do a lot of work there and I was you know tired at night because we were walking in the mangrove and it's not easy to walk there and then the rain at night and you know the water inside your tent and that kind of stuff <laughs> even that kind of stuff is, is is wonderful to experience so probably my my big struggle was um, to deal with with the data because I need that support of course and um, sometimes the th things that are easy for a biologist for me are more a little bit more complicated to to understand um, because I'm learning but I, it's okay I really like to learn more and more every day and I I have this project because I remember my mom told me when you're going to finish this I mean you're you're <laughs> you're it's like your your fellowship finished in 2014 and you're going to continue going to that because she was worried with me when I was there and I said is this for the rest of my life I don't see my life changing I mean a, a period of time or a deadline with this and anytime that I'm have more ideas more um, objectives to achieve and that kind of stuff I feel more committed with the people because <laughs> You know, we want to do something uh, with them. It's, it's a scudo, it's the pygmy slow, but now it's them, it's, it's, you know, because they are part of the process. So it's, that is the, the part that probably uh, I have more difficult uh, moments, just deal with the is things of biology. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Thanks for sharing that. I can definitely see that or almost like a feeling of imposter syndrome or something, especially if someone's reminding you that, hey, you're not a biologist. And it's like, whoa, this is science. Like, there's a way that you do surveys. Like, it's not, <laughs> I mean, to me, being a veterinarian, a wildlife veterinarian and having a jaguar wake up on me and like saving the day sounds significantly harder. <laughs> it's well, if for, if, as, you, as you're a bio, biologist, and you know, for a woman, it's not easy to work uh, in, the, in the forest or to work outside, to, to continue with your personal life and also be a researcher. It's not easy because we are women. We want to have the same, to see, to be seen in the same way that a, a uh, man researcher is him. It's the same thing. And I have in the top of my woman researcher, like Flavia from Brazil or Mariela. I mean, they are doing a, a wonderful job in the Sinatra's group that I'm a member to. And I admire them because they mix their work as veterinarian and also they are working in the field as a researcher. And this is, as a, I mean, this is amazing. Yeah, I love that you bring up Mariella. Her episode just dropped today for the podcast. So we are recording on April 21st. And yeah, her episode just dropped today. And she's my other veterinarian that I've had on. And I honestly didn't even know that she was a veterinarian until we like met up and started chatting. And 
Oh my gosh. I'm just to the point now. I just got to meet all of you. I just, I'm just going to book a flight and I'm just going to start back in Costa Rica, see Adriana again. And I'm going to go to you in Panama and then I'm going to go <laughs> south. And now I have a friend um, who she's going to be on the podcast very soon, who is a researcher in Antarctica. So I was like, so wow. we're just, let's just, Let's just go down the whole America chain. We're yeah. just going to go down. <laughs> gotta see all of you. Oh, that would be so much fun. That sounds like the ultimate trip. Oh my gosh. Gosh. Oh, that's fantastic. Oh, I love that you brought her up. That was that was just <laughs> your timing was perfect. Perfect to bring up Mariella. Oh, that is wonderful. So since I love that you also brought up that you are a woman researcher as well, which I mean, anyone listening could hear that too, but it, there really is another layer to this. And would you say that because of your gender that you've had to face other issues that maybe if a man was sitting in your shoes might not have, what do you think from your perspective, it's been like as a woman researcher tackling this really big problem? Yeah, I, I mean, I think that is the same thing in other countries, but in Panama, it's, it's a reflect of Latin America problem with that. Um, in my case, for instance, when I was in the community, being a woman and talk with the men, indigenous men, was difficult. They don't open it with me at all. Sometimes um, I need my assistant with me because it's men. Uh, it wasn't the language barrier, it was my gender. So I understand that, and that's why I need the support of my assistant with me. But definitely we have to be more careful of being alone in those places. It's just that, and I be more aware about how to deal with people around me and be careful with where I'm going to stay. Even I stay in the same houses, uh, from the fishermen in the scudo. In that time, in the beginning of my project, I don't, I didn't use tents. I live in a piece of the, the, the house of them, in a park, a little park, with all the people. And they have women, women, I mean, every a family were there and I was using a park. And that was good. And also that was, you know, you have to be careful. But the good thing is they were always, um, open-minded to receive me and at the end I received the information that I uh, really appreciate from them that I needed in the project in that moment and then we just talk about I mean recently the last year we have a, a trip in on a scudo and I was on the beach sitting there and it's beautiful to see a little girl that I now is a adolescent adolescent it's a teenager, and I saw her when she was a child, <sighs> and she was close to me talking, and you know, I I saw her grow up, and then and I was talking with his father, who is a fisherman, and I was talking with his brother, like uh, you know, that was different, but I still feel that it's not going to be easy, or it's not easy for any woman who is working in those places alone. Um, because for some reason, sometimes they protect me, even the, uh, if the, I remember two times or twice when I was in the field and my assistant was sick and he couldn't come with me and I request some of the fishermen to be my assistant and they were very good protecting me when I was climbing the mangrove and doing that kind of stuff. So. I don't have a bad experience with them. Just, I just wanna, in the moment I changed the methodology, if they don't want it to be open with me when I was asking uh, or doing the education uh, part of my project. So I avoid to use a person in-person interviews. I will, it was better for me to do, uh, you know, bring everybody in the same, um, house and then just talk about Scudo and they were more open, you know, and of course, if I want to, to speak with a woman, uh, I can, I have that feeling that his husband 
you want to like, you know, do you want to talk? You need to be aware that probably you have to request or ask me first. So I go first with him to ask him and then I go to the woman. So I was just trying to, to, to use a best or the better way to be with them or get information or just talk with them. Um, and I never have a bad um, experience being a, a, a woman uh, in the field as a researcher. That's good. <laughs> like, that's really good because you, you just never know, especially coming to the island for the first time and starting this work. I mean, we only know so much. And, and just like you said, like being a woman and we do just have to be more careful. And I think a lot of us, we know and understand that just from our personal experiences. So yeah, thank you so much for sharing that. And I'm, I'm glad nothing has happened because I know not, not every woman could say that. But on, on this, like if we could keep going down this path, you have experienced so much and you have, you know, reached really great things and have won awesome awards and you're like advising governments and all kinds of amazing things. If there is a message or a piece of advice or anything that you would love to give or say to everyone listening, what might that be? Well, I think that the most important thing is that we have to realize that we are living in the same place. All the human beings and all the living beings are in the same home. So we have to empathize with them too, even if it's a small animal. I mean, we always be more in contact with huge big cats, like, you know, because they are powerful. And, but there are other part of the species that need to be protected too. And we need to be aware of the way that we are behave has a consequence in the future. And we need to start to do our own um, effort to do the best um trying to preserve what we have now and and to continue uh enjoy it in the future to continue enjoying it in the future so that is is very important because probably our daily life is not showing or facing us what is happening in the forest or what is because we are living in the city and if something happened in the amazonia or something happened in the you know, in the scudo, in the forest, in the scudo, it's like, that is not going to affect me. Uh, yes, of course, the, everything is connected and it's going to affect us in some point. So we just need to be more close to our motherland because it's, it's important for us. Yeah. And that's one of the reasons why I do love travel so much. It's, yeah, you see all of that firsthand yeah. when you go to these places, when you get out of your hometown, your home state, your home country, and go see the Amazon, go to Panama, go to these different places, and you do see how connected we are. And yeah. I, I travel for the wildlife, but it's always the people I fall in love with. It's like I make new yeah. friends, and I'm like, yeah, I saw that tiger when I went to India, but let me tell you about this dinner that I had in this like place. And you just feel so much more connected and you really see what's actually going on in other places <laughs> in the world. Cause otherwise it's just headlines or what you see on Instagram or some social media platform. It's whatever some journalist wants to write about, but it's so different when you go yourself and you see these things and that we are all connected and we all honestly want the same thing. We want a beautiful, healthy planet and to have a thriving family and friends. Like that's what I've come to learn that pretty much universally everybody wants. And we've just decided to go about that in different ways. And yeah. <laughs> no, I have to, to add that it's wonderful that you can have this kind of podcast because for the people who cannot go abroad, you you bring all the information and you can see it in front of the computer easily. And this is a good way to be aware of you in the future ones to go to the Amazonia, go to school, or they now know what is happening there. And it's, this is so beautiful and important because we need that. It's the only way that we can educate the people and, and spread the conservation. Yes. 
<laughs> exactly, exactly. Because very soon, um, the podcast is going to have seven continents on, all seven. And <laughs> I like want to add as many countries as possible. And of course, in that goal, and it's not possible everywhere just because I just haven't made all the connections, but actually having local conservationists that are from that country on, because I think that's so special too. Like you're Panamanian and you're on and talking about this. I'm like, that is special to me. And so, yeah, bringing in as many local voices as possible and local means global. So everybody who's around the world, who's trying to protect their home is who we want to have on here. So yes, but you, how can, um, on that note, how can anybody get a hold of you and follow your work and maybe want to learn more and see what's going on? They're like, I'm obsessed with sloths. I need to learn more about pygmy sloths and follow you and everything. What are some online resources that people can check out? Yeah, well, recently we had um, uh, our web page is pygmysloth.org. And we have an Instagram account, Pygmy Sloth Project. And this is a good way to just be in touch about our project, about what we are doing, how we started, and what we want in the future. And of course, it's connected with important pages like the Sinatra Specialty Group too. And um, of course, if you want to see more about my work and or you need an advice about how to go there safely and responsible, you can find me in Duren Smith. Uh, in my account on Instagram too. Perfect. And I will definitely make sure that those are all in the show notes. So everybody just go to rewildology.com and I'll have everything listed right there. You just click on it and be in contact with the audience <laughs> right then, right then in there. Awesome. But Oh my goodness, dear. And thank you so much again oh, thank you. for coming on the podcast and chatting with us and sharing this adorable, amazing species with all of us and how we can, how everybody around the world can also help contribute with your work and protecting this island and the people and the sloths that are there. So thank you again. No, oh, thank you for inviting me. <laughs> Hey, thanks again for listening to this episode of Rewildology. If you like what you heard, hit that subscribe button to never miss a future episode. Do you have a cool environmental organization, travel story, or research that you'd like to share? Let me know at rewildology.com. Until next time, friends, together we will rewild the planet.